Stokes flashes it away through the covers for four, and England have won the match. Hello and welcome to the Analyst Inside Cricket with me, Simon Hughes, Simon Mann having a little holiday, but no shortage of guests on this show and we have a very special guest today. We're in the throes, of course, of the South African tour of England with T20s and ODIs underway and of course the Test Series to follow. And my guest today is a very, very great cricketer from South Africa and I know he'll blush when I say this, but arguably... He is one of the greatest cricketers who never played test cricket, certainly in the modern era. It is, of course, Vincent van der Beel, who was a, a very, very fantastic bowler in the 1970s and early 80s. Your career timed exactly with, uh, unluckily for you, the period when South Africa were isolated from international cricket. So you never got the chance to play test cricket. But I'm just going to read out your stats, Vinny, because... You took in one season of county cricket, playing for Middlesex with me, and of course it was my first season in county cricket, 1980. You took 85 wickets in county championship cricket at an average of 14.72. Astonishing. Right at the top of the national averages for that season. We, of course, won the county championship and what was then called the Gillette Cup, which is now the Nat West, or was then called the Nat West Trophy. It's now the rather slightly devalued Royal London Cup, the longer version of the One Day Cup. We won that competition as well, very much influenced by you. And over your career, and I say, you know, you were one of the greatest cricketers who never played test cricket. Over your career, first class career, 767 wickets at an average of 16.5. Playing in South African Curry Cup, etc. Now, okay, for context, I've got Joel Garner's stats up here from first class cricket. And Joel Garner, generally reckoned to be one of the finest half bowlers who ever lived, similar to you in that he had uh, a similar height, six foot seven, and also pace. And his stats were 881 first class wickets at 18.5 compared to yours, 767 at 16.5. So that just gives you a bit of context for how good a bowler you are. Um, that's a long introduction, but let's hear from you. Uh, look back at your your playing career first. I mean, why why were you so good? It's just almost by accident. You know, my dad played for South Africa. He was a batsman wicketkeeper. A bit like me, a bit cumbersome. You know, he was um, not very sleek like uh, Brett Lee or Lennon Donald. So I had to work with those disadvantages. I wasn't like Joel Garner. Joel Garner, you saw him at Gully, he was fantastic. He was very lithe and had a wonderful physique. I was always, as you remember, a bit chubby. Um, and so what I had to work on, I think were three things. The, the only qualities I think I had was accuracy. I had bounce. I didn't swing the ball enormously, and obviously, if you pitch the seam, the ball seems. So that's everyone does that. And the last one, I found, I found my love of cricket was in the psychological game you had out there as a bowler with the batsman, of working out the guy's faults and weaknesses, and developing plans without a coach and without a bowling coach and without a physical coach. And to be honest, here without a physiotherapist or a doctor. You just sort of went, went on it with your group around you. And we were lucky in South Africa because I played with Mike Proctor and Barry Richards, Pat Trimborn, Trevor Goddard, um, and against Peter Pollock, Graham Pollock, you name it. So we had a very strong group um, and we used to share, we used to share ideas. So I was like an absorber of information. I, I was never destined to be a great cricketer. My dad, when I play for SA Varsities and bowled two bounces in one over, said to me that night, I never thought you'd ever be a fast bowler. I was too sort of easy going. And, but I developed, uh, when I bowled, I was, um, I was quite um, determined. You know? That's an understatement. I, I mean, yeah. you, are, you are a sort of gentle giant because you're softly, softly spoken off the field and a very kind person. And obviously I'll, I'll get on to that because I know... One of the reasons I, I wanted to have you on today was to talk about your work in the community uh, in Cape Town and 
the incredible impact that has had in 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 the township that you're associated with but but before that just to talk about you're on the field you were quite aggressive actually i mean you were quite i think you know sort of an ogresome image uh which w- you weren't like that off the field but you were i think you were pretty intimidating to face i hope so i mean you can't you have to be you know if you i remember procky coming into bowl to me when i was quite young you know this guy kicking himself off the side screen hair flapping and just looking fantastic um so you had to be in the batsman's space you had to glare at him he you had to, he had to know you were serious about getting him out mm. um but you know the way it was done i didn't bowl a great bouncer i mean i did bowl bouncers but they weren't particularly horrific but i think it was just accuracy and trying to sort of work out to contain him completely mm. to diffuse his abilities so and that was the strength i mean in the 80 year of 1980 I was lucky enough to play against Kavasta, lucky enough to play against Glenn Turner. They both got hundreds against me and a number of other really great players. We only played one match against the West Indies, which we didn't do too well. So we didn't really bowl too much because I think they had to score about 90 or 100. Um, But (laughs) you played against the best in the world over there. It was a great um, source of joy for me because I'd read about these guys um, always. I'm a great reader, so I used to go back to the 1890s, 1920s. And these people from Pakistan, India, West Indies particularly, who are greatly admired. My heroes were Alec Betzer and Wes Hall, you know, and I'm lucky enough to meet them both. And I sort of fashioned myself as a galump of, of those two, you know, trying to be accurate and then trying to be pretty aggressive. I mean, Wes Hall to me was dynamite. Mm. And yet when I met him, he's not exactly, wasn't exactly the biggest man, was he? You know, he's like, you know, you shrink a bit, I think. Mm. Wow. I loved him. Yeah, he was, he was a fantastic bowler, wasn't he? Mm. Uh, of course, the interesting thing for you, the interesting experience for you as well, was that you came to, to counter cricket sort of slightly later in your career, but uh, your opening partner for Middlesex that summer was Wayne Daniel from yeah. Barbados. So that was an interesting kind of juxtaposition, given, you know, you were still Absolutely. living apartheid and so on. So how was that? How was that? You know, how was that? Well, the, dy- the dynamic was extraordinary because I think fast bowlers are generous, generally quite generous people off the field. And I, I remember our first game, you hadn't got into the team yet, it was against Knott's. He got four wickets, I got four. But I remember getting my first wicket. He ran across from five legs and jumped into my arms. Now, that was amazing. Seriously amazing. So it was a total acceptance. Then we go down to Scarborough. Were you playing at Scarborough? No. Fred Tipmas actually played. It was in his fifth decade. And the crowd bayed at Wayne and I, the diamond. Because they couldn't work out the relationship between a white South African and a black West Indian. And in the third day, when Bluey Best actually scored 145 and almost saved the game, a number of the crowd came up to us and apologized to us. They said, I'm sorry, because it was quite racist, you know, in its own um, dynamic. And said, we didn't realize you were genuinely good, genuinely good friends. And you remember... I'll tell you a lovely story about Wayne. I presume I can say it on air. Um, Wayne, I came to Maidstone after two years of being away. And I, you guys were playing a 2020 game, or one of you call those Sunday league games. And he came off the field and he said, so, so typical of me, he said, Vince, I've had a cartoon in my bag waiting to see you. And he opened it up and it was two yobos with come off Holly Davidson's with fat guts and chains, walking into a pub and behind the pub owner had free Mandela on his t-shirt. And they said, we'll have two pints of Mandela, please. Which was just lovely. It's typical of him. He was the most glorious of men. I can't tell you 
how much I really loved him. He was very special individual and did a wonderful things for you guys. Yeah, it, it was an amazing um, opening partnership, which I was lucky to sort of follow a little bit as a 20 year old. I mean, just come on as first change, you know, no wonder I took a few wickets because the, go, the, the, well. best, the best, well, the best, the batsmen were absolutely kind of cowering in their boots and they saw me come on and thought, well, hey, here we go. Uh, but but uh, it was Wayne, Wayne Daniels sort of ferocious pace and your hostility and bounce and persistence. I mean, what a fantastic combination that was. It was, it was memorable stuff. So, so tell us what you've done since, uh, just just briefly, um, before well, we get to your before we get okay, to very, very quickly. I, you know, during that time we were amateur. The only time I ever got paid for cricket really was the Middlesex. So we always had jobs. I was a teacher. I just moved across from teaching into Wiggins Tea, it was a paper merchanting company based in the UK under BAT, and I started as a rep. Um, the only reason I got to England was JT Murray and Don Bennett came out and my boss who I just joined happened to be a Middlesex supporter of 1949 and saw the famous Edrich and Compton's Golden Sun and so they persuaded him that I should go over and I could actually um, go to a couple of mills that were owned by Wiggins Teep and I eventually ended up uh, doing a, a week's course there so I went back to that job and I eventually ran the company after quite a long time. Um, and then, you know, I'm not a financial genius and I'm not a financial man. I like the human spirit, basically. So I joined one of our clients and then I went and became director of cricket in South Africa for three years before going to the ICC. And that was it. Came back at the age of 67. So I joined... ICC when I was 60. I was quite an old bloke. And I came back here and then really had a sort of, I had a cancer issue. So for a year I was off the charts and then I wanted to find some purpose. So I started what I do, Massey Sports in Massey Pomolela. And before that, you, you, you looked after the ICC sort of umpires for a bit, didn't you? Umpires and referees. So it was, uh, it was fascinating because I was privileged to be involved in the global game. So, you know, I was due to tour of the West Indies in 1971 and never got there, not uh, Australia, and never got there because uh, we were isolated. And eventually got there um, a long time later, went to the West Indies, spent a lot of time in Asia and learned great lessons in Asia um, about being accepted and outside of being accepted. Not the fact that I was from South Africa or white, I was just an outsider. And how long it takes for them, the Asians, as well as the black communities in South Africa, to trust an outsider. Because they're so tired of people coming and either feeling superior and what to do. And so the lessons I learned in Asia were very important to the work I do in the township of South Africa. Yeah, so uh, so tell us about that. So how did you get involved in that? And uh, um, before you do, by the way, I, I should just mention you're speaking today from Fran Franjuk. Is that the pronunciation? Fishuk. 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 I'll start that again. Uh, um, so just before you get into that, you're you're speaking today from Fishuk, which is on the Cape Peninsula. Um, yeah. I, those who are watching this in video can see this, but go on, just give us a quick uh, sh a, a glance at where you're. Where you are. Okay, so we have a we have a view from heaven. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Bev's got a my wife's got a B and B called Heaven Sent, and if I just tell me if I'm doing this right. Yeah. This is I see the ocean and blue sky and mountains and a beach okay. and a few <laughs> little roofs. You know, there's not many houses you can see. Absolutely amazing. The whole of Bay. It's it's a ridiculous view. Yeah, it's stunning. Uh, amazing yeah. and it's close to where you're doing your essential work it's, it's, it's three kilometers away so so tell us how you got involved in that community and what the state of it was and and how okay. it came about and we should mention by the way that mc the, the mcc foundation that runs around 64 hubs in england and various ones in other parts of the world as well were quite influential in supporting this 
this uh, Yes, I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, very briefly, I came out of cancer um, for about a year, and I just thought, God, I've got to do something, you know. Um, so I phoned a guy called Brad Bing who runs Sporting Chance, and I said, Brad, um, I'm happy to be a pro bono coach for you and go and work in some of your workshops, whatever. And he phoned me about a week later and said, listen, there's a school in Masi Pomerera called Okanya. And Okanya wants to start cricket in that area. They had some cricket before, but it fell apart. So I went to the school. Now, I used to be a teacher, okay? So I taught at high school for about 10 years. So I'm very sensitive. First of all, I love dealing with kids. And I'm very sensitive to the feel and dynamics of a school. Went and sat down in this poor township, 50,000 people in half a square kilometer. 50,000 people in half a square kilometer. And I sat there in this poor community, 70% unemployment, 24% HIV AIDS. And there's that like one netball court. And as this kid tripped across the um, netball court to go to school, she was slightly late, beautifully dressed, she was singing and skipping, and I thought, wow, here's a kid coming to school from this impoverished environment, happy. So I started, it took about a year and a half, as it does, those are my lessons of Asia, to infiltrate myself and develop a level of trust with the school governing body, the schools, and the community. And then I went, I was part of the MCC World Cricket Committee, very loud to be invited on it by brilliance and I had sort of challenged some of the committee to say I know you're involved with um, wonderful programs but I think we all should be involved in a program that we have our hands dirty that we actually work with so they said to me the next day okay big boy you go out and do it and so I spoke with Derek Brewer and brilliance and Derek Brewer was fantastic and he took about nine months to, for the MCC to be willing to give me 50,000 pounds over a three-year period to be startup capital. And there we started. But you know, Yaza, as you know with your life and I know with my life, you should start somewhere and your whole pathway just grows and keeps growing. After five years, it is still growing. So what started as a school program became a sports program then became a facility building program, then became a life skills training program, then became development of coaches. So all our coaches come from the community and they are excellent. And we have eight sports. Now we also have um, hip hop dance, which I only found out recently is, a, is an Olympic sport, would you believe? We do have chess, we have a choir. And we're introducing this term art for the first time. So this is an holistic program to develop the individual. It's just like, I'm not sure whether you would agree with me, but I for many years thought cricket changed my life. And it did in a way, but what changed my life was learning life skills that cricket taught me. Discipline, sociability, teamwork, looking after others, helping, caring working hard um, and so those are the qualities i believe that develop proper full positive human beings there's three things really there's sport and and passionate pursuits playing a violin painting whatever there, there's your life lessons and there's education and in the end i think the most important one of those three things, even though they're integrated like a marriage, are life skills. I think the ability to deal with people, the ability to see your future, those are the things that really count. So tell us about the uh, the situation. You found the school in, you said it was an impoverished yeah. community, uh, no sports facilities. Okay. Okay. There's quite a lot of, uh, I think, violence, uh, yes. boy on girl. Um, you know, yes, quite a, bit of, a okay. bit of a problem with, with being a girl in that environment. And yes, there what is. did you find and how has it changed? Okay, so when I got there, there was one coach, there was one um, netball court, the only sport that was played against other schools 
was um, was netball. So we put in three cricket nets, two 40 by 20 Astro turfs, and one big field, 60 by 30, with blades of Astro play soccer and rugby there. Teams. We have 800 people playing sport after school. We've got 550 who take their sport very seriously. And we've infiltrated the staff. So 11 of the staff volunteer free and they don't get paid much. And they, you know, they live in a poor environment to help us coach because they see the joy of the people's faces. The other thing which is important is litter. Litter was horrific when we got there. We never made a thing of it. But because they developed discipline through sport, litter disappeared. It's the most amazing thing. When I got there, I, I don't know if other teachers would agree with me, but we found that at the, in the township, 10-year-old girls always beat 10-year-old boys in a sprint. And the 10-year-old boys would always get very uptight and push the girls over and hurt them. And I spoke to the, the um, coaches about this, and we agreed we would just let sport take its course. That doesn't happen anymore. We focus on two things other than sport and life skills and education. Two things, one is gender equality. So all our teams are mixed except rugby, even though we're starting to get girls playing rugby. All those other sports are mixed. So they're girls in our cricket team, they're boys in our netball team, um, they're girls doing cycling, et cetera, and, and all the other sports. So that was the one. And that has created I'll give you an example. We played against uh, Generations, which is a private school up the road. And our front line of our soccer team were all girls. Beat them 9-0. And who scored the goals? The girls. So the boys backed them up and the girls scored. Now that leads to respect. Experience gender equality. It's not, you can't teach life skills in a classroom. They have to experience the humiliation of defeat and the glory of victory and what hard work means. And that's what sport and other pursuits can give them. Mm. And the other one we work on is social cohesion. Uh, I was lucky enough just to pop across to America to see someone literally last week. And you know, in America, you can't have a conversation about Trump because the people are either Republicans or Democrats. It's impossible to have a conversation, to actually agree on things, to compromise, to discuss, and it, that is a worldwide issue. Brexit was the same. Well, in this country, we have divides. And the divides are education, residential, opportunity, racial, religious, wealth, you name it. We've got every divide. And part of our problem is we don't talk and we don't share. So what we do is we play sport against other schools. And we mix with them and we talk to them and the staff integrate. And in the junior school and high school, which we're starting to operate now, um, which is great. For example, in the high school, we have three kids under 16 who play in the Fisher Cricket Club second team. In the junior school, we've got 14 kids who play in their youth group on a, on a Saturday. And in rugby, we do the same with their youth group. And that's important because those clubs are totally mixed, whites, coloreds, and blacks. There aren't many Indians in this area because that's mainly in the town. And they get to know each other. So when they leave school, they can keep members of this club and work with society, a general society. So, I mean, you would understand the problems in South Africa. I don't go into the detail of that, but we haven't really moved on as far as division goes. We still have the townships. We still have lacking opportunity. Uh, the, the education in the black schools is appalling. 87% um, is below average. Twenty so you've got massive inequality still then, really. Yes. Uh, uh, one more last example, just as a stat that will shatter you. 94%, 94% of schools do not have sport after school. We've won three cricket, rugby World Cups. We've been number one of three different formats of cricket from 6% of our schools, the 25,000. So all we can do, and this is where it's difficult, we can't change the world, but we can start the ripple. We can start doing something which is meaningful.
And then hopefully we've got two schools, one in the Eastern Cape, one just up the road in Westlake, who have followed our process. And the Department of Sports are bringing in five guys. We're going to do a workshop with them to explain how you can introduce sport to the school at a very cheap price. One of the reasons I, I obviously think it's a, a, a kind of pivotal moment for South Africa, perhaps, is because... Uh, you know, obviously, the work you're doing is starting to have a ripple effect, but but also we've got the recent announcement of the T20 uh, new league starting in January, hopefully. Yeah. And uh, you know, the the interesting thing is that all the teams have been bought by IPL franchises. Oh. I mean, you know, a is that a good thing? And B, do you think that will help cricket penetrate society more effectively and have the sort of in impact and effect that that your uh, your campaign your your policies have been providing whether we we both and everyone knows that india is the major force in cricket worldwide and if you don't have some sort of links there which graham smith and Cyril ganguly had which allowed us to have the tour you have difficulty. So that gave us considerable injection of cash. And this will give us considerable injection of cash. Um, and this country is not economically strong enough to sustain an IPL type environment. We just don't have the economy to do that. And we don't have the leadership to do that. So, and I'm talking leadership as in general for, for the country. Um, if you said, is it a good thing? Yes, it is a good thing right now because it's going to be an injection of money. It reminds me a little of China in Africa, you know, but that's a, that's a side issue. I think it's not going to really change anything from the um, grassroots point of view. But the grassroots... Could they, though? I mean, could, could they have that impact? Could, could, you know, an IPL team... Get some community schemes going, and you know. Yes, no, the IPL are. I'm. I mean, I'm involved in talking to. Uh, I've been asked to be involved in talking to someone in next week on that. How that goes, I don't know. So they will have an impact. But the important thing is the lasting value is for us to create capacity within the township. So as long as that impact is not um, one of the great players coming in and ha having a net. It's better that they work with the coaches and the teachers to ensure that when they go, that impact remains. So that, that's part of our sort of mantra is to develop the capacity within the township. I, I call ourselves interventionists. What, what is Massey Sports? We coming in, providing something to them, showing them opportunity, getting a glimpse of what life could be like. So, to tell you, Massey is in Fishhook. So, it's between Komiki and Fishhook. It's about two and a half kilometers from the sea. 25% of the township have never seen the sea. We're 45 minutes from Cape Town. Over 50% of the township have never been to Cape Town. So, they're very cloistered. So, we have to break them out and produce the social cohesion so they can see their own futures. Not the future of cricket or rugby, but see their own personal future. That's the only way we can change this country. Amazing. Um, are, are you seeing, you know, you've been doing this now for a few years. Five years. So have you seen the fruits of, of the, oh, yeah, the labours? Yeah. You know, what kind of yeah, case? I can tell you stories, um, Yaza. Um, stories of kids. There's just one. I'll, I'll send you a video once we've got the link. We just released it. Of, of a child who's 12 years old, who, um, or, or Vio, who lives in the shack on the wetlands, which is the poorest part of Masi Pomelel. And Masi Pomelel has wealthy and poor like any community. This is the poorest part. She's brought up by an unemployed single mother. And she came and joined our soccer team. Within a month and a half, the confidence within her is absolutely extraordinary. And you'll see in the video that when she's talking to the coaches, she's talking like this, absolutely confident. Whereas she was teased a month and a half, she doesn't get teased anymore. Now that's a small win. How she's going to develop when she's 21, I don't know. But I do know she now understands 
her own personal strength. And I can tell you examples of a 15-year-old girl, Zola, watching rugby and thought, why is it only boys? So she joined. She's now plays for False Bay under-16 youth. She's an under-16 cricketer who suddenly came out of nowhere, almost made the Western Province girls' team. Um, our soccer and netball are just phenomenal. We had, I don't know if you know, Dragons in Oxford. It's a, quite a, mm. a top school. And there's also a very good sports school called Perrins in Surrey. They came and toured us. And our under-13 netball side played against the under-15s of Dragons. And the size, size difference was like this. We beat them because these kids are so good at passing. So they have developed confidence within themselves. So they play for the school. Mm. So mm. they're confident of Okanya. And they're learning the life skills. So I was speaking to some great twos the other day. It was a beautiful little conversation. They were lined up about 10 of them like birds on a wire. And I said, okay, from one to the other, and Teddy was there and never were there to help me. I said, tell me what you do when you wake up, just one thing each. It went from making my mother tea to making breakfast to making sure I've done my homework to get my homework signed, to make sure I'm neatly dressed, to make sure I've packed everything for the day. Grade two, this is beautiful. So those are the things to me that are important. I know I sound, I think I'm getting a bit like a, an evangelist, you know, I really believe in this stuff, totally, absolutely. No, oh, you, you, can, you can definitely hear it in your voice. So. You know, just just to finish, I mean, obviously that that's a fantastic uh, contribution to society. What about no. what about the wider nation, South Africa as a whole? Uh, give give us a sort of sense of where the cricket is now. You know, with, they've had you know you've had quota systems to deal with and different yeah. governing body uh, chairman and all sorts of. Uh, it's always been yeah. in flux a bit. So, where do you think South African cricket is now? I think it's in a better state as far as leadership goes with our board. Uh, Lawson and I do, and they've got some really good independent directors. And they seem to be leading us better. Um, it's going to take time, I think, for the, the players to have total confidence because they've been disappointed for so long. You know, you don't just switch on confidence like this. But I think they are working with them well. The Players Association, I know, get on well with the chief executive. And that's the change. You know, the previous chief executive felt the Players Association was just a union and really all the stuff is made by the board and they should just listen to the board. The players themselves, we are, I think, work in progress. You know, we have good games, bad games. You've just seen those in England in the ODIs where you have a shocking game, and then the first game was fantastic. Um, as far as the quota goes, um, we've, we were slightly better off, funny enough, about two years ago. Um, a lot of the batsmen coming through are not from all demographics. So that's something they have to work through, as you will see from the teams that are being picked over there. But we have some wonderful role models. I mean, Ngidi, Rabada, Bavuma are exceptional role models. So I think the work that they do outside the community, you know, I mean, Bavuma's got a foundation like Sia Khaleesi. And there are a lot of people from every demographic doing that. So I think that's going to bring it through. Because people in the townships need to see the role models and yeah. work with yeah. them. I was, just say, I was going to say that because I, I don't know, does, does cricket penetrate the townships yet? Yeah, but you know, if you're looking at sport, soccer, netball are number one and two. Rugby has become pretty popular because of the World Cup, but cricket is, I would think, number four. Mm. Might have that, someone might disagree with me, but I think it is, it was when I was with Cricket Society, the second most popular cricket sport in South Africa. Whether rugby has gone past it, I really don't know. But we're in a better space now. And I think the IPL will help us get a financial injection. We've been pretty shy of making profit on a yearly basis. We've been dipping into our capital from the past, I think. So we are in a better space. And I think we better regarded by the global community, which is just as important. You know, not, it's not just India. India and South Africa have a relationship that goes back to Mandela. You know, they have Mandela 
and Mahatma Gandhi, you can't have two better world leaders. And they develop similar sort of processes and there's a deep respect. So I'm glad that has sort of filtered down over the years into cricket, which I think is very important to us. So I think in the short term, having India with the IPL is going to be great. It's going to give us money. They're going to do some work in the townships. But it's what the people in the townships and the people that surround them do that count. I promise you, Simon, if you walk through the streets of South Africa, or in Cape Town anyway, I haven't been to Joburg for a while, there's a camaraderie between people across um, colors or religions. It doesn't really matter. So the people on the ground are in good shape. It's the economy and our political leaders which are which are not growing great at the moment, and that we have to get right. Leadership is a big issue. Does it worry you at all for the game that uh, the South African board have decided not to play some internationals in Australia so that all the leading players are available for your new T20 competition? Well, it's the same as the IPL being provided a window. I, I think that is a not just a South African issue. I think what we're talking about is a global issue on cricket. You know, why can't we have, uh, we just had this MC World Cricket Committee. You know, there are lots of different views out there. My view was that we needed to have a window of just test cricket, where you don't go from domestic league to T20. People get so confused. You know, when you hook into a World, uh, World Cup rugby, it's rugby in the World Cup. You do that with soccer. You do that with um, Wimbledon and Australian Open. Mm. And we are just now a hybrid. We don't know where the hell we are. We don't know who our he certain heroes are playing for. Um, so I, I really feel like they seem to have produced a window for the IPL. We should have a window for Test Cricket. And we should cut down the sizes on, of Test Cricket. It's, it's not so much the domestic league. It's what are you going to strategize for T20? Are you going to leave it as domestic or you're going to use the cash cow of the ICC T20? At the moment, there's nothing wrong with having three formats. I was in a, I was in a taxi um, in, in London recently and the taxi cab, because they always got such fine wisdom, said, you know, you guys have got it right. You have kept going with the new generations. I took my 12-year-old daughter to six hours at Lord's of seeing the girls game and the boys game. She said she's hooked. But she couldn't get hooked on a test match. And I understand that. We've got to remember that bit of it. But I think we've just got to sort out the structures. And our problem is, as you know, we've got a member-based um, board at the ICC. So it's very difficult for them to look at the global issues. And we have to bed that down. So I don't think this is a South African issue. I think this is a global issue. And you've got grandchildren. Um, would, you, uh, would you encourage them to be a fast bowler? I'm trying to persuade my granddaughter here to be a fast bowler. Uh, there's a friend of mine, David Dyer, who's just been over to England. His grandchild there is a lightning fast bowler. She's about 12. And I think girls and boys, um, I think girls to be a fast bowler will walk into a team. I think being... A girl in cricket is really good because you can start cricket at 15, as there's so many examples, and play for your country at 19. Being a boy, that's not possible. So girls' cricket can really encourage good athletes to go through the system. And also when they get mothers, they'll follow the game, so it'll enhance the game. The boys is different. I mean, it's <laughs> a good question, Simon. I prefer my, my grandkids to be a good-looking dude fielded first slip and bat number four, you know. But um, the discipline I learned and the love I had playing fast bowling was great. Well, fascinating to listen to your your story. And uh, I just want to say, you know, thank you for, for all you've done for the game so far. Oh, and no. will continue to do for society. And yeah, I was, I mean, I, South, Africa is a, South Africa is a unique country, which yeah. I think I'm sort of, I was privileged to experience a little bit of yes, that, yeah. that, that, that cricket in the, the 1980s, early 80s was the Curry Cup. It was probably the most competitive cricket I've ever yeah. played with the standard of each team. And uh, let's hope that you can get back to that, I guess. Yeah, I'd like to say this though, Yaza, just so you 
people don't think I'm doing amazing things. There are hundreds and thousands of people doing what I do here. Yeah? Um, I, I owe cricket a huge debt. So I don't feel I'm entitled to anything. Cricket has done amazing things for me, given me huge opportunities. And so the work I do is just joyful and a pleasure. Um, and there are lots and lots of people in South Africa doing what I'm doing. And I'm just a networker. So I, I use a huge amount of NPOs, cool play on life skills, MCC Foundation, who I had meetings with recently, who supports us and support us with ideas. And then a whole host of rotaries and other NPOs. So everyone's involved here. It's not just me leading your charge here in any way. It's a bit like a game of cricket. We're all individuals working for the same end, you know? I, I really want to say that I'm, I'm not anything special. <laughs>